All right, um, I, I hope you can see the slides and the recording is on. Uh, can I have a com confirmation? Yes, James, we can see your slides. Okay, thank you so much. So this, the, the last lecture in today's uh, two lecture series is on food habit formation and food evasions. And um, again, we, want, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Ina for this. She, he was very instrumental in the original design of, of these uh, lectures. So we're talking about food, form food habit formation and food evasions. And in this slide, what we see um, in terms of food habits, remember when you talk about food habit, a habit is something that you keep on repeating. You, you, you have developed it over some time to such an extent that it's not easy to quickly break it or to stop it. So it keeps you you have to keep doing it and um, when it comes to food and nutrition there are advantages for that there are disadvantages for that the advantage is that if the habits are healthy for example if you have got a habit of constantly consuming foods that are good a balanced diet diverse foods and then that promotes your health but if your habits are negative in terms of uh, continuously consuming foods that are high in salt, for example, foods that are sugary, foods that are full of fats and things like that, it means that can be dangerous because in the end it affects your health, it affects your well-being. So that's why it is important to, uh, to study food habits uh, and uh, food habit formation as well as food uh, aversions. So now in this diagram, we just show the way uh, as an overview, the habits are formed. You see the word routine, in other words, it becomes something that you keep doing in a cyclic way. Change of a coup is where the success rate is highest. And otherwise, if you can change the things that you, you that trigger the habit, and then it means you can change that habit. Because a coup is something that causes you to act in a certain way. So you see that there is a coup, and then in the end there is a reward. And we have been talking about reward. In this case, dopamine for sweet and fat. So this is a reward system that is linked to, um, to, to the senses of taste and to the senses of, um, of smell. But there can be reward systems even outside the sensory systems, just to mention that. If you engage in an action and then you are rewarded somehow, that strengthens the habit. And this is how a uh, habit are formed. So in this uh, case, this diagram shows the stages of habit formation. We see that on stage number one, you need to perform an action. And uh, I'll take an example of going to a, a restaurant or a cafeteria, and then you choose a particular food. Maybe every time you are going to go and buy streetwise two chips. The first day you do that, the second day you do that, and it becomes a stable context. Uh, where you are going, the context is not changing and you are not changing your action as well. Then there is repetition. You keep repeating, it's already stage three. And after repetition, <coughs> it, there is now the cooling stage. In other words, if you, if you don't do it, you, you experience the concept that it seems there's something that I have not, uh, that I have not done. So there's motivated cooling and there's also direct cooing. And then after the cooing, we have habituation. 
it's now a habit that has formed. So sometimes biology is included in the model. Uh, as you can see in this diagram, the interaction of uh, the genes, the interaction of the individual choices that people make uh, in different circumstances, as well as the environment. There's a lot that you can discuss about these three uh, circles and how they interact. Uh, for example, Nomzamo talked in one of the lectures about uh, uh, the food choice questionnaire, the individual choices. We can also talk about the environment. Nowadays, there is a lot of talk about how the environment, sometimes we tend to focus a lot on the individual to say the individual has the power and authority to change the choices he or she makes, not forgetting that even the environment itself has a lot of cues that attract people towards unhealthy diets. The environment like restaurants, the environment like um, uh, the vendors in the street, the environment in the supermarkets, how does it also contribute to the likelihood of consuming certain foods or to the likelihood of making a habit to buy sweets, a habit to, uh, to buy certain types of foods. So as we've explained already, the four stages of habit, we have the cooing stage, we have the craving stage. Now it's a craving, it's not easy to, to, to ignore. And then there's a response uh, stage. The response is you're already indulging, you're engaging with whatever it is. In this case, it's a food product. And then when you buy, you consume it, or you repeatedly go to that restaurant where you crave, you experience the food and the context, and then you are rewarded. You feel good if you have visited, for example, um, McDonald's. You feel good if you have visited another uh, uh, food court. Then you get rewarded. And remember, we're talking about the aspect of the serotonin level, the aspect of dopamine levels, and other hormones that are associated with reward. So the more you are rewarded, the more the cyclic pattern repeats. You want to do it again. So that's what happens with, uh, with habits. Good habits, uh, they, they, they get, if they get re rewarded, it means you continue to do them. And bad habits, again, if they are rewarded, you continue to do it. It's only the outcomes that are different, as you can see in this arrow. The bad habits, the outcomes will go in a different direction. And the good habits, obviously, the outcomes will go in a different uh, direction. So that's why it's important to modify the, the habits, or at least to define how we form our habits. So most of the information is coming from the, I think we can Google and find this book, uh, The Power of Habits why we do what we do in life and in and, and business. I think now it was adapted to, to Sensor. So how can we change habits? This is one of the models that has been proposed uh, in terms of how people can change their habits if they are bad or how, can, how they can change their habits to gain good habits or to promote good habits. For example, there are three levels. We have the personal level, we have the social level, we have the structural level. It's almost the same as the previous diagram where we saw the genes, the individual, <coughs> and the, the environment. So at the personal level, the, at the top you see there is motivation, there is ability. Personal level, connect intrinsic motives. So this is talking about the person. The person should be able to connect the intrinsic motives, what you want to achieve internally inside uh, with the habits or with your choices. And at the ability level to deliberate practice, it means when you say, this is what I want to do. For example, I want to be healthy. That's a motivation. I want a healthy lifestyle. It becomes a motivation at personal level. And then you have to deliberate that, which means it's now a verb. We must act to ensure that that happens. Do you have the ability to do that? Then you have got to do it. 
you must take steps, you must take actions to implement that. At the social level, now this is the micro level, the motivation, you encourage new behaviors. Now this is beyond the personal, it is now uh, the policy levels, institutions, we need to encourage new behaviors and uh, we need to enable and assist in acting. So it's not only about writing policy papers or doing research. We must go beyond that and enable people to do that. Create circumstances, create conditions that allow uh, behaviors to change. We're talking about food related uh, habits. Uh, how can you ensure that the food in the restaurants enable people to eat healthy, for example? At the structural level, it's about changing the economy and uh, it's changing the space. It's almost related to the micro level. The micro and the macro level are policy related and connect as well with the political will to change, which is a government uh, uh, arena. It's a government uh, responsibility. So in terms of habit formation and changing habits, you see in this diagram, it's written hacking your brain. In other words, the reward system to change the habits. What, what the diagram is trying to illustrate is that if we can, if we can manipulate the reward system, the dopamine, the serotonin and other hormones, so that we still experience a reward without eating unhealthy foods, that will be better. So that's what they mean about hacking your brain system. Uh, habits related to the production of happy brain chemicals are more difficult to change, unfortunately. That's another interpretation of it, to say that uh, the brain has already been hacked. It has been hacked towards sugar foods. It has been hacked towards fatty foods. So that is difficult to, to change. But nonetheless, it can be changed. So this part is what I was explaining earlier on to say, if we can manipulate the hormonal system so that we still experience the pleasure principle um, without eating toxic uh, foods, uh, toxic in brackets to mean to say that uh, sh sh foods that are associated with the unhealthiness, then that will have the reward by eating plant-based foods, then that will be, that will be uh, the best thing to do. For example, dopamine is about reward, endorphin, suppressing pain, oxytocin, the feel-good hormone, and serotonin uh, is also a feel-good hormone, but when these are not in balance, we experience some mood disorders. So that's how habit is. This is just showing about habit formation in different people. People want to continue doing what they are used to doing. Remember, there's also a habit to always continue to be interacting, be it with Facebook, be it with WhatsApp, be it with technology, it becomes a habit. And a habit, obviously, a common example is those people who use uh, drugs, illegal drugs, sometimes it becomes a habit because you can't stop it. It has become a habit. So what happens is you keep on getting the reward system, like the likes on Facebook, uh, on, on Twitter, I mean, you are being rewarded. You post something, people like it, a lot of liking, a lot of rewarding, and you want to repeat that. You want to keep doing it. So this is an example of uh, manipulating uh, the brain, manipulating the hormone system so that you still get the reward that you want to experience, but you are not taking sugars. For example, this is extremely sweet, but the uh, container says maximum test, no sugar, which is a good uh, approach to use. So basically, like we explained in one of the lectures, um, the issue of the uh, uh, habit formation is uh, happening in the brain. That's why it's written playing into our right brain. 
because the right brain is associated with the affect, the hedonic aspects. I like this. I the more the emotions, the mood, and things like that. So when the right brain is hacked, it becomes a habit because you want to keep doing that. If you don't do it, you feel bored, you feel punished, you have mood swings, for example, you don't feel good because that deals with the affect. Whereas we know that the left brain is about reason and logic, as we explained uh, in one of the lectures. So because of habit, for example, of consuming a, a particular sweet juice or soda drink, maybe once or twice per day, you end up liking maybe sweet foods, be it sweet, uh, be it salty foods. Over time, your body mass index keeps increasing. In other words, you slowly become unhealthy. You are transitioning from a healthy state to an unhealthy state over time because you keep repeating that habit because indeed it is a habit. Now, focusing on children, uh, there are many approaches that have been suggested how you can change uh, diet habits among as children. One is to ask them what food tastes like and not how much they like it. I think we talked about it in one of the lectures as well, to say, how does the food test? I, I mean to say, what does the food test? In other words, put them into an analytical mind state, a reasoning mind state, as opposed to a hedonic, a liking, an affect mind state. So that teaches them to focus more on the objective properties associated with the food. For example, health promoting. Ask them to measure their hunger and fullness. I think this is what has been um, uh, yet point in the earlier lecture uh, was pointing to, to say that if you focus on hunger, if you focus on fullness, you can change habits because when you experience fullness, then you've got to stop it. Uh, the next point is bringing attention to the cognitive part of the brain, to the left part of the brain, away from the cognitive and emotional. I think this one is associated with the first uh, suggestion. <clears throat> now about aversions. Aversions, as the name sounds, this is when people, in this case, children, do not like, they have a strong dislike for certain foods. They don't like it. They don't even want to try to eat it. You have got to make a fight, for example, if you want to make them eat. So those are food aversions. They are biological reactions to prevent us from being harmed. So that was the adaptive significance of that in an evolutionary sense. They were meant to prevent us from eating things that can poison us. Uh, However, nowadays we know that uh, we have different approaches to make sure that the food is safe, but still aversions exist even for foods that are supposed to be healthy and good for us. Aversions are caused by food neophobia, they're caused by power struggle, and uh, sometimes after a sickness, you end up not liking certain foods. And in other cases, uh, some processing disorders like uh -huh. uh, palsy uh, among its other conditions. So uh, I, I see this slide is talking about texture. Uh, of course, we, we know that if textures are not well suited to a, to a particular consumer group, they may lead to food aversion. People may not like the, that food. For example, infants, the elderly, or people in a state of sickness, cancer uh, patients, if the texture is not adapted to them, that can cause to, that can cause food aversions as well. And again, sensory processing disorder. Now this, this is actually a healthy state that can lead people not to like certain foods. I will not get into a lot of details about it. But as you can see, people with sensory processing disorder can experience picky eating. They are choose what to eat and what not to eat. But 
the interesting part is the brain is plastic, as we have said in the earlier lecture. We can train the brain, we can train the senses to like certain foods, but that requires rigorous training. In this case, training for their syndrome, uh, for this syndrome, involves exposure to food in a 10 step approach. I think it's a method that we can actually look for uh, even online. But here it says the first step is just being, the person is put in the same room where the food is without eating the food. Probably that is step one. And then the second step, that until the last step when the person can now be asked to try the food. You can see this is a very serious uh, uh, aversion uh, disorder. Now, signs of sensor processing disorders. There are many. And when you ask, perhaps in a form of questionnaire, and you get these responses, I hate having my hair washed, brushed, or cut. This could be signs of SP, sensor processing disorder. I cry and sh shield my eyes from the sun. Uh, but there's one that is particularly interesting. I'm a pig eater. I resist new foods and textures. So this is actually an area, I think, in sensory nutrition that uh, specialized people are dealing with in terms of helping people with certain disease states to accept food so that their health and well-being is not compromised. <clears throat> so when we see that the food aversions are related to some disease states or some brain disorders, then we need to involve the right people. In this case, that could be doctors, that could be nurses, uh, and then we work together with them, uh, perhaps them leading the way and us as sensor scientists coming when it comes to optimization of the types of foods, formulation, design, and optimization of type of foods that can be given to such. Thank you very much. We can have questions uh, now. I, I do not see questions on the chat. Please, if there's any, just remind me or raise your hand. So this was this was a very short uh, lecture, and uh, <clears throat> I would like to thank you all for attending and making time available to be part of this. Next week is going to be the last two lectures in the current uh, workshop series, and we look forward to your participation in it. If there are no further questions, allow me to stop the recording.